It's uh, my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful venue tonight. My name's Julie Beveridge. I'm the CEO and Festival Director of Brisbane Writers' Festival. Before beginning this evening, I would just like to acknowledge the Yagara people, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we gather tonight to share stories and ideas. I pay respect to their past, present and future leaders and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people present this evening. Acknowledgement has to go as well to our principal partners, the University of Queensland, and our major partner for ideas, McCullough Robertson, whose support enables us to dream big, delve deep, and thrive. There's always something wonderful, we think, about reconnecting with amazing people like Elizabeth Gilbert in the context of events like these. The last time Liz was in Brisbane, was for Inspire Creativity in 2014, and she left the room buzzing and hungry for more. At home, I tell my husband that Liz is the new Oprah, and he doesn't get it. <laughs> and so I say she's the new Elvis. She's a modern-day Springsteen guiding women through a different river or through an alternative Badlands. And with that, he's read every word. And she evokes the thought that we, all of us, can live inspired and creative lives, that we are capable of big magic. And I feel equal parts inspired by the life Liz believes I can live and in equal measures envious of the life she leaves, the conversations she must have with the amazing people she connects with and the ease with which it all seems to occur. So what's the secret? Why aren't we all Elizabeth Gilbert. <laughs> I'm sure you connect with that, sir. <laughs> and so at home, we've taken to referring to Elizabeth as not just Liz, but Aaron, which is Elvis's middle name. <laughs> and she's made her way into our lexicon, and I'm sure that's an experience that would be shared by a lot of you in the room. Um, she's become an intimate part of the vulnerable fabric of our inner lives. She is a candle burning and flickering, and we are a whisper of moths. And speaking with her tonight is the wonderful Mia Freeman of the Mamma Mia Women's Network. And so please join me in welcoming both Mia and Liz. Cheers. You're a sneak. You switched your I've wine. I switched to water. And I, now I look like a booze bag. You do. Because I'm the designated driver. An hour ago, less than an hour ago, we were doing our sound check and singing Madonna songs. So I believe you'll be able to find that on the internet. Yes. Welcome. Hi, sweetheart. I feel like it's strange welcoming you to Australia because you are almost Australian. Oh, <laughs> can you tell by my distinctive Australian accent? I can. Um, in <laughs> fact, you said you were even looking at getting maybe some Australian citizenship. I am, happening. yeah. My husband is an Australian citizen, like most Brazilians. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Um, but we come here every year. His kids are Australian. I've yes. been coming to Australia every year for 12 years, sometimes twice a year. Um, Nice country you have here, you guys. Well done. Really, well done. Thank you. Except and when I asked you where it is that you base yourself when right. you're in Australia, what did you say? Canberra, which I understand is the New Jersey of Australia. <laughs> I feel, you know, I feel lately I actually have become a little defender of Canberra because... You're because I feel like one. somebody has to. <laughs> and living in New Jersey, as I do, which is a punchline for Americans, I, yeah, right. I always feel like it's kind of cool to live in the underdog place that everybody thinks is cool. It's really embarrassing. Yeah. I kind of imagined that you'd be like Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or Byron or somewhere, you know. I love all of those places, but this is where the family lives. So Canberra, that's where we go. yeah. Is you know, you, you go, we, 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 we go where the love is. Now, I, I asked you when I met you tonight, did you drive here? Uh -huh. Probably not from Canberra, but if you follow... Um, Liz's Facebook page, which I'm sure most of you do, and if you don't, you should. Uh, you talked about learning to drive in Australia. Yes, I can drive in America, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not the most confident driver in the world. Spatial orientation is not a gift of mine. Machinery, also not a gift of mm. mine. Um, and, but I can do it, you know, I get around. And, and I've been, as I said, I've been coming to Australia for 12 years. 
And it just never, never occurred to me to drive here because I can't. Wrong side of the road. Wrong side of the road. Steering wheel on the wrong side. Listen, I have cultural politeness. Other side of the road. <laughs> wrong side of the road sounds very pejorative. There is no right or wrong side of the road, <laughs> Mia. But you guys totally are on the wrong side of the road. It's just a side um, where you're more likely to have accidents. <laughs> so, so, but what this changed? time, you know what I realized that there's a. I realized that it's it's against everything that I sort of stand for about how women should position themselves in the world. That I let my husband drive me around because he knows how to drive in Australia. Why does he know how to drive in Australia? Because he learned. Um, mm. He came from a country where they drive on the other side of the road as well. But it just, I, I didn't even notice it till this time. It's one of these things that catches up with you where I thought, mm. why am I just, why am I just going to be a passenger in this car and in my own life? Mm. Um, dumber people than me have learned how to drive in Australia. <laughs> I am sure, I am sure it could be done. So I insisted <laughs> on it and it was tense and it's frightening and now I can do it. Yeah. And I can also be more useful, like not just to myself, but to my daughter-in-law and my grandkids, I can pick them up at daycare. I can go and do things for people. I'm not just, you know, I just hated the idea of being like, I don't know, it just makes me feel like somebody sprawled out on a divan eating chocolates. Like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. <laughs> you know, like, of course you can. Of course you can do it. And I feel like sometimes we just get lazy about what we're capable of. Um, so yeah, now I can, I drive all over this bitch. It's <laughs> what I call your beautiful country. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's the 10th anniversary of Eat, Pray, Love. I've yeah. got my little dog-eared copy in my bag for you to sign afterwards. Mm. Um, wow, 10 years. Yeah, right? Does it, how do you feel when you look at that time? <clears throat> it's gone by like 10 minutes underwater. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a, a joke that my hus a friend of mine's husband said to her on their 10th wedding anniversary. 10 minutes Feels underwater. like 10 minutes underwater. <laughs> um, it's... Um, cute, right? Uh, he also, she said, do you think I'm a MILF? And he said, no, I think you're an M-I-L-H, a, a mother, mom I'd like to hang out with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I didn't even, couldn't get the numbers right on that letters. Um, I, it doesn't feel like 10 years has gone by. Um, if you were to wake me from a dead sleep in the middle of the night, I think this is an interesting question. If you had no preparation and somebody violently shook you awake and asked you how old you are, how old do you think you are? And yeah. I think I'm 34, but I'm not. I'm 46. Um, and, I'm, and I've thought I've been 34 since I was 34. And 34... You just stopped. Well, is that when I think I just... Came out? That's when I went uh. traveling. And I feel like that's when, oh. in a weird way, that's when I stopped the clock, not on aging in life, which of course we cannot stop, but I stopped the clock on living a life I was not meant to be living and started to live life as I was meant to be living it. Mm -hmm. And then it was good from then. So it sort of paused something in me. Like this is, this is how it is now. Um, so in a way, the Eat, Pray, Love journey hasn't ended. You know, mm. I'm still that person. You know, I became that person on that journey and I'm still that person. And then there's a new book coming out at the end of March called Eat, Pray, Love Made Me Do It, yeah. which is what, like an anthology of stories from women who were inspired by the book to do various things. Women and men, believe it or not. Ah. Um, and uh, three of them. Uh, <laughs> but still, um, one of them heterosexual. It's amazing. No um, way. But... Uh, yeah, that was a really cool idea that my publisher had as a way of honoring. We we're trying to think of something cool to do on the 10th anniversary. Mm. And we came up with this idea to put out a call to ask people to share stories of things that they had done or changed um, because of Eat, Pray, Love. And that was reading those essays and choosing them was a really powerful experience for me because it was a sort of tidal wave of the same kind of story coming again and again and again. And it really answered for me in a way a question I've never been able to answer, which is why did this book do this? Mm. Um, why did Eat, Pray, Love become Eat, Pray, Love? What was the thing? I don't, people have asked me that and I don't and know. And what's the answer? Um, I mean, I still don't know. We'll never know. The definition of a phenomenon is mm. unknowable and also unrepeatable. Um, if I knew, I would do it with every book that I've written. <laughs> um, but it, uh, what I saw reading these essays was that in each person's reading of Eat, Pray, Love, there came a moment, and of course, this is a selective community of people who will say that their life was changed by that book. So it's not every reader, but it's these particular mm. readers who were really touched by it. There came a moment where they realized, my life doesn't have to look like this anymore. And this was a bunch of different stuff. You know, this was terrible marriage. This was mm. addiction. 
this was you know, soul crushing job, this was toxic relationship with dysfunctional family, this was um, you know, not finishing college, you know, all of these sorts of things that they had just decided was what their life was. Mm. And then something happened reading Eat, Pray, Love, because Eat, Pray, Love, of course, is about a woman who says, my life doesn't have to look like this anymore. What if, it, what if everything changed? What if everything could be overturned and, and it could all be done anew? And so it was really exciting to see that that's what it is. It's this reminder. And I think for me, it's kind of shocking, and it's shocking because it happened in my own life as well. It's shocking how many women never got the memo that their lives belong to them. You know, um, because the memo seems to constantly be that your life, in some measure, belongs to, to others all the time, to your family, to your community, to your, you know, it belongs to you. You've talked about getting to the end of yourself. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about that? That oh. idea of getting to the end of yourself, yeah. but not stopping there. Yeah. Okay, so getting to the end of your power is, mm. is a really interesting moment in people's lives. And it's a moment, the moment that precedes surrender usually, and this is something that my friend Rob Bell, uh, Pastor Rob Bell, who I love so much and I hope you're all down with, um, talks about all the time. When he was studying to be a minister, somebody gave him the advice to go sit in on AA meetings mm -hmm. because they said, what you've got there is a room full of people who have come to the end of their power and they're not full of shit anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they're not walking around pretending to be okay when they're not okay. Uh, they're not walking around saying that they can do stuff that they can't do. They're not walking around in masks they have reached the end of the deceit and they have reached mm. as far as they can go. And now they've turned it over in this act of surrender to say, I can't manage this anymore. I can't manage my life anymore. Essentially, every single person who ever walked into an AA meeting has come to the end of their power and the end of themselves and they've said, uh, I need help. And, I'm, and this isn't working for me. And was that you at the, on the bathroom floor? That was me on the bathroom floor. Like, the, I think many of us reach a moment in our life. And that moment, the scary thing about saying, I can't do this anymore, this isn't working for me anymore, is that you don't know what the next thing is. Mm. It's not like I had some sort of super rock star moment where I looked in the mirror and I was like, this marriage is bullshit, I'm out of here, see ya! <laughs> you know, like, I was in a pile of snot for the sixth <laughs> consecutive month having lost 20 pounds, having, you know, it, because I didn't know what the next thing is. Mm. You, know, you were stuck. I was, I couldn't do this anymore and I don't know what the next thing is anymore. That is a moment where you have no choice but to mm. start by saying, this isn't, my life can't look like this anymore. And I don't, and then people say, well, what are you going to do? And then you say the three scariest words on earth. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. And, you're, and I think one of the scariest things, especially for somebody who likes to sort of take charge of their life, is to admit that I don't know is a perfectly legitimate answer sometimes in life. Sometimes it's the only answer. And then you have to start searching. You have to start going to wiser people than you and older people than you and professional people who charge you $150 an hour <laughs> and saying, I don't know, what do I do now? And starting to rebuild something from there. But it doesn't happen until after you've come to the end of yourself and then you build the new self. You said in your um, TED Talk, your 2009 TED Talk about creativity, I think you started it by saying, or maybe it was your 2014 one, you, you started it by saying, after you wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and it was this phenomenon, and it was the bestseller list for 100 years, and everyone Has said Has it already you, been 100 years? <laughs> at least. <laughs> and everyone was like, are you scared? Are you scared? What's going to happen next? Yeah. And you said, I don't know. And then you wrote Committed, which you described as having bombed. I loved the shit out of that book. Thank you. Um, I really did. I loved it. I would love your go-through list if, if I could read it. But <laughs> I, I loved it. Um, I loved it. Uh, but it didn't have the same resonance as Eat, Pray, Love, and it didn't have the same commercial success. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, what was more disruptive in your life, success or, f oh, can we say, failure? Yeah. Let's commercial um, failure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Look, life is a disruptive activity. But was success, um, was Eat, Pray, Love just all awesome or were there some challenging things that came with that? There were some challenging things that came with it, but I also was really careful not to make it into a curse because I feel like yeah. one of your jobs in life is to try not to turn blessings into curses because there are so few blessings. When you mm. get one, like, you should be kind of glad. Like, it's so, so I'm, I was always trying to remind myself 
having a giant best-selling book is, is actually awesome. not on the list of like tr like horrible things that have happened to human beings. Many <laughs> worse things have happened. Have to bear. I, so I didn't ever see it as a problem. I saw it as a puzzle, uh -huh. right? And a puzzle is just a problem with the drama volume turned down, right? Um, Say that again. A pr I don't know what I just said. A puzzle. It was really profound. A puzzle is just a problem with the drama volume turned. The drama down, volume turned. Right. Down. So yeah. instead of saying, "Oh my God, this is a disaster," saying like, "Wow, this is really interesting. I've never been in a situation like this before. I don't really know what you do next, huh? How do I puzzle my way out of this? How do I do this in a way that is going to work for my life? Um, okay, here's the things I don't want to do. I don't want to never make work again. That's something mm. that sometimes happens to people after they've had huge success. Mm. That would be really sad for me because I love, I love working. I don't want to live in constant cannibalistic competition against myself and say that my life is some sort of a stock market grid where the line must constantly be moving upward and to the right, which means that I must do 10% better than myself every yeah. year. Were you, you know? scared writing Committed? Yeah. Did it feel different to, to other books that you Yeah, had? it was weird. It felt jarring because I, f I had never written with an audience before. Um, mm. You know, Eat, Pray, Love was my fourth book, but Committed was my first book that I wrote while people were watching. So they say dance like no one's watching. Yeah, every, I was dancing and everybody was like, she's not that good a dancer. You know, <laughs> like, she's got no hip flexibility. I was like, you never said that 10 years ago when I was dancing when nobody was watching. Um, so it was weird, but I also yeah, felt right. like, okay, look, there's only one way for all of us to get through this. And by all of us, I meant me, the fans of Eat, Pray, Love, and the haters of Eat, Pray, Love. Mm. We're just going to have to break the spell. Like, someone's going to have to make another book so that you guys can all have an opinion about it, and we can and all get on with on. our lives, right? <laughs> so the day that Committed was published was the most liberating Amazing. Normally, book publishing day is often a bit of a letdown, sometimes weirdly, like, mm. oh, this is supposed to be a big day, and it's not. That day, I just felt like, okay, spell's broken. Here you go, you guys. Go have, go whatever. Go, like, love it, hate it, say it's not as good, say it's better, say, like, I know, just whatever. We're, then we can just go on and do other things and talk about other things. And that, mm. Harper Lee having died this week, mm. is what I wish Harper Lee had been able to do mm. um, when she was young and vibrant, is break the spell of the thing so that, so that everybody can get on with their lives. Throw a police procedural novel out there, write mm. a cookbook, mm. something, do a thing, just anything, to just break the spell. Get and through it free. and keep moving forward. And keep moving it. forward so that you and can keep working. Moss. Yeah, and then you get to do whatever you want. Then yeah. 10 years, not 10 years, three and a half years of researching yeah. Moss. And thank you for Alma Whitaker. She's an extraordinary Aww. feminist, wonderful character, a gift of a character and a woman that you gave us. But that really was not, it didn't seem to be in the trajectory in which you were heading. Right. Was there a lot of pressure to go in a different way or not anymore. go on another trip? <laughs> get another divorce right. um, just keep getting divorces and writing about it um, people seem to like it when you do that um, but did, seriously did people say that to you uh, no in so many but, words you know here's the th here's the cool I mean the thing is after committed this is why this is why I love the book Committed too. When I call it a disaster, I only mean commercially. Yeah. Um, you know, it sold, I think, literally one one thousandth of the number of units of Eat, Pray, Love. But that's still an incredible result sure. for anyone but else. But if you're a corporation, which is what publishing companies are, that's yeah. a significant drop off in sales. Yeah, right. right? Um, and if you're somebody who gauges her herself on how well you're doing compared to a former version of yourself, that's a disaster. Yeah. Right? Thankfully, I'm, I'm not, not that, that person. You know, um, so, so what happened was, after that was done, I was like, well, now no one's looking, mm. right? Because now... They all wandered off. Everybody wandered off. To go off. and watch Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> to be up, yeah, or Twilight. Watch her dance. Or like whatever the next thing was yeah. that was the big thing. So now everyone's wandered off. Now I can do any... I felt like, <gasps> okay, now I can play like play really freely and the other thing I felt was now I can take huge risks creatively because it doesn't matter anymore you know it just felt like and it shouldn't ever matter but it really felt after committed mm. like it didn't matter mm. it just didn't matter so I thought and I also thought look I have something that very few women creators have ever had in history I have total agency over what I do next mm. and I can 
pay for it myself. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to go to a publishing house and beg them for an advance to write a 500-page historical novel about a virgin who spends her life studying moss. moss. Like, <laughs> because guess what? The elevator pitch. That you nailed pitch that. is going nowhere. <laughs> I get to just go do it. I just get to go do it. Yeah. Which is weirdly also what I did in my 20s when no one cared. Mm. So there's this weird thing that happens in the creator's life. There's a period where no one cares about you mm. and you do whatever you want and you're totally free. And then if you get very lucky, there's a period where people care about you and then that can be a lot of pressure. And then mm. maybe there's a period where you get over the hump where maybe nobody cares about you again. Mm. And weirdly, what you return to is how you used to create before anybody was watching. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that's what the signature of all things was. Yeah, it was me. just my dancing dancing in the dark. And you said, you said that, that you give, in many ways... Um, the signature of all things was more revealing of you personally than Eat, Pray, Love, which seems counterintuitive. Yeah. Somebody taught me this, that, that when you're writing memoir, you're always writing fiction. And when you're writing fiction, you're always writing memoir. Whoa, mm -hmm. clever. <laughs> it's a kind of a koan, but it works because the thing is, when you're writing a memoir, you are so conscious of how you are curating mm. your story. So when people say Eat, Pray, Love was so intimate, it was so revealing, you gave so much of yourself away, my thought is, well, not really. Like, if I had published my diaries that I kept while I was traveling that year, that would have been total nakedness. Mm. But I didn't. I curated a version of those diaries, mm. and I chose very carefully what was in there and what wasn't in mm -hmm. there. And it wasn't that I was trying to sell a certain polished version of myself. It's just that it was a... it was. It's an act of art. You're making something and you're deciding. And I also was very super cautious about what I said about other people mm. in the memoir, right? So there's a great deal of restraint in there. So a lot the, of other people's stories in, a lot of in every memoir. Stories like, you guys don't know anything about my ex-husband, mm. you know, because I was really careful about that because mm. I didn't feel safe mm. talking about a lot of that. Mm. And so there's things that you're, you know, there's names that are changed. There's mm. all sorts of careful things writing about your family. There's, stu there's decisions that you have to make that are very calculated and very self-protective in a lot of ways. When you write a novel, all the bets are off because it's not you. So it ends up being you, right? Is it Alma you? Totally. Yeah, right. <laughs> totally. To everyone in that book is me except Prudence, the good yeah. one. <laughs> the virtuous one, except the virtuous one. And that's why she's mysterious too. So you can put parts of yourself yeah. in everybody. Yeah. And parts of other people that you don't have to protect. Family. You can learn more about my family by reading <gasps> Signature of All Things than you're going to read from any me memoir. You know, but, okay. but Alma's, like, there's things in there that happened to her that are just super magnified versions of things that have happened to me in my life. Mm -hmm. And I can freely it's talk safer. about the it's emotions. It's a safer space. Yeah. Whereas in the memoir, weirdly, a lot of it's contained. Mm -hmm. So um, you end up, I feel like it's like, if a book is a crime scene, a <laughs> memoir has been scrubbed and cleaned and disinfected and a novel I've got fingernails and hair and bits of DNA <laughs> all over that thing because I didn't think to wipe the steering wheel off Bodily fluid you know um, because no I'm like ah, no one's gonna know it's me yeah, um, but right. it's always you it's always you in some in some disguise and then big magic so I mean it's impossible to predict your trajectory big magic came from did it come from the talks that you were doing? Where did it come from? Because it was such, it's been such a seminal book. I've bought it for every Aww. friend of mine that's a writer, that wants to be a writer, um, that's not a writer, but just is stuck. Oh, that's it's, it's kind a, of you It's like a brilliant book. Thank you. Where did it come from? Well, Big Magic is a weird book for me because I've never had a writing experience like this for a bunch of reasons. One, I've been thinking about writing this book for 13 years. Mm. And... The reason I, I had a bunch of reasons why I didn't, one of which was I didn't know how to say what I was trying to say. Um, I didn't know if I had the authority to say what I was trying to say mm. because it's a manifesto. Mm. So I think I may have felt like I needed three or four more books under my belt before I had the authority to write a manifesto. Your first book shouldn't be a manifesto <laughs> about how to be creative. Like I think I needed to write The Signature of All Things to yeah. be like, okay, I can talk about creativity. Mm. you know, um, and, and I needed to have been through success and failure and different mm. kinds of things to feel like I had that right. Um, so part of it was that. Part of it was that I knew I wanted, there were things I wanted to say about creativity. I, I've always, in my fiction and nonfiction, been m big researcher. So everything, like Signature Bell things took me four years of mm. research to write about that. Um, I've always gone to the experts in a way to find out about things. And so for years, I've been collecting books about 
all these different aspects of creativity, the neuropsychology of creativity, biological aspects of creativity, genetics and creativity, um, the links between creativity and suicide, creativity and alcoholism, creativity and depression, creativity and, you know, and I had hundreds of these books. And one day I looked at the shelf and I was like, if I have to read even one of these books, I'm going to fucking kill myself. <laughs> like, I don't give a shit. So you collected them, but you didn't read I them? I didn't read one of no. them. I didn't read one of them. Here's another thing I didn't do. I didn't go sit in a lab with a guy in a white coat who's an expert on creativity and interview him. Great. I was Here. Like, I'm an expert on creativity. Yeah. I've been doing this my whole life, and I know yeah. what I know. There also, I think, comes a time in a woman's life where you decide that you know what you know, mm. where you don't need to back it up with a million footnotes. You don't need to maybe go and you know, sit in the, the latest think tank to hear what the links are between the cerebral cortex and creativity. I know what <laughs> I know. I know what I know. And what I know to be true is that creativity is this remarkable conversation between human beings and mystery. And it's one of the greatest invitations in the world to be allowed to participate in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And that ideas are these strange disembodied life forms that have energy and they have will and they have consciousness. They just don't have body. And they circle the universe looking for human collaborators, going from person to person saying, are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Do you <laughs> want to work with me? Do you want to? And mostly we say no because we're afraid. Mm. And every once in a while we say yes. And when we say yes, we enter into the most strange and mysterious relationship with the weirdest, most otherworldly force. This idea that wants to be made and wants to be made through you just as much as you want it to be made. And it is not your master and you are not its master, but you're in some strange dance with each other. And together you will make a thing that maybe wasn't what the original idea was and maybe wasn't what you had in mind, but is a thing that didn't mm -hmm. exist before and that maybe has no rational reason for existing. The other crazy and beautiful and strange thing about creativity is that when you embark on a creative adventure, you are doing the most fundamentally irrational thing you can possibly do. You are saying to yourself, to your family, to the universe, to destiny, I am going to take the single most precious resource that I possess which is my time, my mm. mortal time. I'm not here very long. I don't know how long I have. And once I spend my hours, they can never be gotten back. This is a currency that, that once spent is gone. Mm. And I'm going to take that currency, and I, when I could be using it to do all sorts of very rational things with my time, advancing my empire, finding cute people to have sex with, you know, um, pr reproducing, working harder so I can build an in-ground swimming pool in my backyard, like all <laughs> sorts of things that you could be doing I'm going to take that time to make something that nobody needs, <laughs> that nobody asked for, that maybe nobody will like, that mm. maybe nothing will come of, that maybe we'll never sell, that maybe you won't even like. Mm. And I'm going to spend days, weeks, months, years doing this totally irrational thing because dot, 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 I don't know. Mm. Nobody knows. Why do we do this? And we're the only species on earth that does this. And all of our ancestors did it. And our children are born doing it, making things for no reason, creating things for no reason. It's this aspect of our shared humanity. It's so weird. You talk about, in, in Big Magic, a lot about... It, it's this dichotomy between the inspiration and the magic, the magical thinking and the magical process, and then just the workmanlike nature of just showing up, yeah. as you say. Yeah. How do you... Is it balance <laughs> yeah. yeah! This is a word we promised we were never going to use again balance. in women's lives. How do you... How sort do it you, out. <laughs> it, like, do you expect, like, there's 80% showing up, 20% <laughs> yeah. magic? How does it work for you? Yeah. I suppose you can only talk for yourself. Well, somebody said to me the other day, I don't get it. Do you believe in magic or do you believe in a work ethic? And I was like, yes. How do they coexist? <laughs> <laughs> Tick. The answer is yes. Yes. The answer is yes, because there is no one without the other, right? So, the, so normally I think what the, the mistake that people get in terms of creativity is there's this very sort of macho way of looking at it which says, I am the master of this thing. Nothing's happening here. Nothing's coming through me. I am creating mm. everything. I am the great artist. I am Hemingway. I am Picasso. Mm. I am Nabokov who said when somebody asked him, do your characters ever take on lives of their own? And he said, my characters are galley slaves to my will, right? Ooh. Like there's that, which is like super muscular, super aggressive, super about being in a battle 
with this thing yeah, and yeah. dominating it, right? Mm. And then there's the altered and other way of looking at it, which is super airy, fairy, flaky, new agey, which is like, I'm just a vessel. <laughs> I'm just a vessel. For the muse. I'm just a muse. And I don't even know where it comes from. It just like pours through me. You know, um, I hate those people. Also, it's so passive. Yeah. You're like, I'm a hand puppet of the divine. You know, um, <laughs> and there's no will in that. There's no mm. muscle in that. There's no, there's no you in that. that. There's no character in that. There's no mm. interesting thing in that. So what I think is that it's not either of those. It's, it's a conversation. It's a relationship of strange peers where I bring my labor and inspiration brings the mystery and then we do the best we can with it. Um, and so the difference in that sort of having it be a relationship like that is that you can have a conversation with it. Mm. I feel like it's having a conversation with me, right? Ideas come to me and they ask me, you know, do you want to work with me or not? You know, do you want to do this thing or not? And then I can engage, I can look at my life and the realities of my life and answer reasonably. You know, one of the things that people will say to me is, I have so many ideas, I'm just so, and I never know which one to do. And I was like, Take charge of it. You're the boss of you. Right. Pick one. Pick one and tell the other ones to get in line. <laughs> right? And this happens all the time where I'm working on a book and I get to the boring part, mm. which is, you know, the fun, exciting part was the idea. And then I started and mm. now it's two months in and now I sort of hate it. And now I'm, it's lame and I know it's not going to be as good as I thought it was going to oh, be. Good. And then another too. idea comes all seductive. Yeah. And it's like, come away with me. I'm sexy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and here's yeah. the thing I know. I look at that sexy, provocative, like harem dancer idea that's like, let's run away together. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but in two months, you're going to look like this. <laughs> so we're going to finish this and then we'll see how hot you are like <laughs> later. Um, but you, you can assert yourself, right? So when you pretend that you're just the vessel, you don't have the right to say that. You don't have the right to push back. And when you pretend that you're Nabokov, mm and that you're totally the master of it, then you are not being humble in the face of the real and strange mystery of inspiration. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, like when I'm working and it's not working, so I used to just, like when I was younger and I would go not, I'd go upset and I'd hate myself and be like, well, I can't do it, crying, you know, drama. Now, what I get that I didn't used to get is that this thing's trying to help you make it. And if you can be patient mm. with it, it will show you how to make it. To and what, push through. So stay with it. Stay with it. So it's not as much pushing through as stay. So I'll say to, I'll sit in my room and I'll say to the novel, look, I am so on board. I'm so committed to this. Anytime you want to send me some information, that would be very <laughs> helpful. But like in the meantime, I'll be here for the next hour. And, and I'm just going to sit here and I'll be mm. here and I'll plug away. And I really want to get up and watch a couple episodes of Breaking Bad, but <laughs> what I'm going to do is just stay here for the hour because that's my commitment to this, and I'm going to try, and I'm going to work, and it's not going to be satisfying, and that's okay, but I'm here because I know you're here, mm -hmm. and you know, sure enough, 45 minutes in, something's there, you know, um, and sometimes I think people spend their lives waiting for inspiration to show up when inspiration is waiting for you, it's waiting for you, it's like, are you... I feel like so many times, like it'll take me a year to get a book going sometimes because I feel like inspiration's in the corner watching me like, are you really going to do this? Mm -hmm. And I have to show it that I really am. That you're prepared to. And when I show up, it shows up, you know? And when it shows up, I show up. And we're trying, we're both trying to do this thing. And what we end up with is something very strange. But the experience of doing that, I think, is the coolest way you can possibly spend your life. In those bored, not bored, but those not moments bored. of frustration yeah. or boredom or... Uh, yeah. Um, how do you resist the temptation to just get on Facebook? Because, yeah. and I say that seriously, because you have built this extraordinary, in the past year or two, Rebecca Sparrow got me onto your Facebook page and it was a revelation. I didn't realise that you were on Facebook. And not just on Facebook, but posting sometimes things that are 2,000, 3,000 words long. <laughs> You're <laughs> writing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you are engaged and dynamic and the things you post are, are so fantastic how do you quarantine that from the work that you have to do as a writer? Because that's, talk right. about seductive. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a certain amount of time a day, and I don't do the 2,000 word ones every single day. Sometimes I just no, put I a know. picture. I know, it's, I like think that's selfish of, of you. Goats, I really wish you would. <laughs> a, a picture of goats on Pop-Tarts wearing like sweaters them. in outer yeah. space. Like sometimes that's the post. Um, 
uh, or a link to something someone else very clever Absolutely. did. That's but always a nice you, way to do it. you nurture it but like yeah, a garden. I do. You I tend do. to it. You tend to I your do. community. You know, I think, I think there's just this... Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it that doesn't sound fascistic. It's this self-accountability. I hold myself accountable for my work. Mm -hmm. um, so I know when I'm... I know when I'm not holding myself accountable for my work. I know when I'm on Facebook when it's okay that I'm on Facebook, and I know mm. when I'm on Facebook when I really ought to be doing something else. And I hold myself responsible for knowing the difference between those two things. I'm a grown-up. Do you have to police it? Yeah, you have to police everything. Mm. Because right? there's instant gratification from Facebook, yeah. from the interaction that you have. And as a writer, you write something on Facebook, ooh, 100,000 likes you get. That must feel good. Yeah, um, or somebody telling me that I'm a dog's breakfast, right? Um, but that's <laughs> social media. Um, no, I just, I, I don't know how to explain it other than to say I have to hold myself responsible for my work, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that what I'm doing on Facebook is part of my work. For instance, there would be no big magic in this particular form without the conversations I've had over the years on Facebook with people about the things they're afraid of with creativity that led me to find my voice to write that book. So I know I'm being assisted by it also, mm. but I also know I'm blowing smoke up my ass if I pretend for a year that by writing a Facebook post every day I'm working on a book, because um, I'm not. You know. Um, so, so it's really about, and, and when I say, the problem with the word discipline is that it's very hard and it has an inbuilt idea of pain. Mm. Um, it's friendly, tender, compassionate self-accountability, right? Um, which means that some days I don't get it right. Some days mm. I waste the day. And the next day I'm like, okay, so we wasted the day yesterday. We're not doing that today. <laughs> um, and then maybe we will waste the day, that the, you know, but we'll just keep, there's this friendliness that I feel like I've cultivated with myself. I think the single most, the single biggest advantage or gift that I got out of the Eat, Pray, Love journey, and mm. especially those four months in India in meditation for four months, was the friendship that I forged with, with the weirdest parts of myself, um, the most unlikable parts of myself. Mm. You know, the recognition that all of us are sort of stuck in this car together. And when I say all of us, I mean, I mean, none of us is a self. We're all a mm. pile of selves. Mm. And there are parts of ourselves that we like and sort of wish we're in charge all the time. And there are other parts of ourselves who get up at two o'clock in the morning and eat a quart jar of peanut butter. Mm. And, and that's that, you know? Um, and there are parts of ourselves who are generous and forgiving. And there are parts of ourselves who are vindictive and snarky and bitchy. And, and what I sort of, I used to think that you could only befriend yourself when you had perfected yourself. Mm. Um, and now I know that you can only befriend yourself when you're like, oh, I love all of you dummies. <laughs> um, like, so the part of me who sometimes blows off a day or a week or a month, it's all right. Like, I got back from my really big, big magic book tour for the last four months in the States, and I didn't, I'd been working on a book, and I had been really disciplined about working on it every day, even when I was on book tour. And I came home so tired, and I didn't do anything for s almost two months. Mm. Um, and that was weird, and for a while it was relaxing, and then it wasn't relaxing anymore, and then I panicked and thought, maybe mm. I'm not a writer anymore. I went through all these things, and now we're back. We're back <laughs> online. You know, but, it's, but it doesn't benefit you in any stage to practice self-abuse in any way. And I know this as much as I know anything in the world. Any voice within your mind that speaks to you with cruelty is not your highest self. It simply will never be. But then social media is filled with cruelty. And um, a lot of people, when they t think about being creative, what they're terrified about is the response. I mean, Eat, Pray, Love came out before social media, essentially. Yeah. Um, but that idea of you put yourself out there and now, in real time, you get real abuse. And it's unfiltered. Yeah. And you're quite active on your Facebook page. How do you manage that? How do you not let that infiltrate how you feel about your own work or your, yourself on a particular day, even the way you look? Yeah. Um, well, for one thing, miraculously, my Facebook page is full of pretty kind people. And they police. It's self-policing. Yeah. Your Facebook page, and I also noticed. what I've noticed, and I noticed this, if anybody follows Humans of New York, do mm. you follow that Facebook, Honey? This is interesting. Um, grace, vulnerability, kindness, humor float to the top. Mm. and savagery sinks because Facebook has um, this weird uh, um, algorithm thank you um, that is that, that, you know however many people like a comment mm. it sort of raises it up so I don't have to ban 
or mm. delete or chop out rude comments because they just sink mm. and the grace rises every mm. single day um, because people choose what they, and, and because of the, the people who come to that page, mm. first of all, are obviously, mm. readers of You Pray Love tend to be pretty nice people. Yeah. They're not hate, you know, people don't hate read on your page. They, they don't hate read on my page. They hate read about, people hate me other places, but they don't hate me so much on my Facebook page. <laughs> um, you know, because it's a big waste of, it's like a lot of time for them to invest that they could be doing other things. Um, but, the, but generally speaking about the criticism, look, I don't like it, mm. you know? Um, and I think to pretend that you don't care or that you do like it is kind of weird and sociopathic. So I think to start with, let's just say... It hurts. It hurts, I don't like it. I don't like it when people mm. say mean things about mm. me. Mm. I like it when people say nice things about me. I'm weird that way. I'm the only person in the world who's <laughs> ever had that strange biology. Um, I would prefer it if everybody liked everything I did, but I know that that's not possible. And I know that if you dare to make a thing mm. and to present it into the world, then other people have the right to have an opinion about it. And they have a right to speak their opinion about it. That's the flow of ideas, right? In, even though now we live in this kind of crazy, unfiltered, wild, anonymous, you know, comments page mm. world, it's just a magnification of what has always been the case, which is if I get to speak, so do you. So when you're creative, do you have to, by your nature, or to save your, your sanity, divorce yourself a little bit from how your creativity is received, how yeah. whatever it is that you've created has been received? Yeah. And you had best believe that it's okay no matter what happens, right? Otherwise, you're in quite a world of trouble when the book is published. Mm -hmm. So you need to really convince yourself that you are okay regardless of what they think of you, even if it doesn't feel like that mm -hmm. in every moment. Mm -hmm. And and some things that I, you know, I don't read a lot of my reviews anymore mm -hmm. um, because I've, I've become really self-protective about who I take criticism from and when. Mm -hmm. and Tell me about that. So you have to take criticism, otherwise you won't improve, mm -hmm. right? But you get to choose who you take it from and who you listen to. So I have a few rules. <laughs> um, that people have to pass before they can criticize me that I'll listen. Mm -hmm. Number one, is the book still in production? Is there time for me to change anything, right? I don't read the reviews after the book's out. It's too fucking late. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go back and take that obnoxious part out of Eat, Pray, Love, It's Done, right? So, so we have to do it at the right time, yeah. and the time is when I can change it, yeah. right? I know that seems very obvious, but... That's that a really true. good reason not to read the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the criticism yeah. too late. Um, so, is it the right time? Yeah. Do you, the person who I'm showing this to, have my best interests at heart? Mm -hmm. um, you know that friend of yours who advertises herself as being brutally honest? Mm. Fuck her. She's just a bitch. <laughs> She's an asshole. She's an asshole. She's an asshole. She is. And when people tell you with pride that they're brutally honest, what they are telling you, and they're being very clear about it, is, I am brutal. And I cannot wait for the opportunity to brutalize you. It's like when people say, with all due respect. Oh. Means they've got none for or you. Or I hate to say it, but no, you don't. You love to say it. Um, so <laughs> the brutally honest person is just waiting for the chance to harm you. Um. So I go to compassionately honest people. Yeah. Um, and there is such a thing. You can be honest mm. and you can be compassionate. You can hold... You can read my work and be very clear about what you think is working and not working in it and hold also in your heart the understanding that I'm a sensitive person that, whose feelings can be easily hurt, so how you bring this information to me matters, right? I'll show you my work. Do I trust your taste? Mm -hmm. You know, do you and I see mm -hmm. things and read things and feel things the same way? And I feel like there was one other one. I feel like I had five rules. Um, so the reason that I don't often read official book criticism of my work anymore is because as much as I respect and admire the fact that book criticism needs to exist mm -hmm. and it's a part of the whole cultural conversation, that book critic does not owe anything to me. Mm -hmm. That book critic is not, their job isn't to make me a better writer. Mm -hmm. They have obligations and ethical responsibilities, but mm -hmm. those responsibilities are to the newspaper that they work for, to the readers who they work for, and to their own sense of taste and honesty. Mm -hmm. I'm the last person who they need to be caring about, and I don't listen to criticism from people who don't care about me, mm -hmm. because it will hurt, it will end up hurting me. John Updike said reading a book review is like 
of your work is like eating a sandwich that might contain shards of broken glass. So even when there's a good review, they might throw a little bit of broken yeah. glass in there, you know? And I don't think it's beneficial for me or anybody for me to be ingesting shards of broken glass. I would be better if you didn't. It's not good for your digestive system. No, especially in white pants. <laughs> <laughs> there are two Facebook posts of yours that I absolutely love, which were both longer ones. Uh, one more recently that was in everybody's Facebook feed. Everyone I know was talking about it and we we're all sending it to each other. You talked about the difference between a mm. hobby, a job, a career and a vocation. Right. Can you just recap that? Sure. I think I can do it. I'll try to do it quickly yeah. too. Okay. So I think when, uh, when people are confused about what they should be doing with their time and with their life, I think sometimes they have a lack of clarity about the difference between these four words, which often become conflated mm. and confused and misunderstood. And the words are hobby, job, career, and vocation. Um, hobby is a thing that you do for pleasure. Um, the stakes are so low. Like coloring in. Like karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> like us singing Madonna we before good, the show, I which I, I, I'm sorry to say we rocked. I think um, we were really good, yeah. You know, it's okay. You can, you can bomb, you can fail. It's something that, you, a hobby is a wonderful thing. You don't have to have one. But if you have one, it's really nice because it's a way that you show that you are not just a cog in the machine of production, that some of your hours belong to mere, pure pleasure. And your creativity can be rooted in totally. that, right? Totally. It can just be that. It can mm. just be that. You do it because it's fun, because you like it, because it brings you pleasure. Awesome. Mm. Before television, everybody had hobbies, mm. right? Everybody had hobbies. Um, now everybody's hobby is <laughs> television, including to a large extent mine. Um, the second thing is a job. You don't have to have a job, a hobby, but get, you have to have a job. Mm. You have to have a job. You have to have a way to get by. It's a material world. You need to feed yourself. You need to have a roof over your head. Um, unless you have a trust fund or somebody is completely mm. supporting you, you should have a job. I would argue if you have a trust fund and somebody is completely supporting you, you should also have a job. Mm. It is a great point of honor, especially for a woman, mm. to have a job, to have a way to pay for yourself in the world, to have the freedom of mobility that mm. that gives you in the world, to be able to change your life if you need to, to be able to take care of yourself, to be able to pull your own weight. Got to have a job. Here's the thing about a job. It doesn't have to be great. Mm. You don't have to like it. You don't have to love it. It doesn't have to fulfill your every single desire. It doesn't have to be awesome. It can be boring. It can be lame. It's fine. I've had so many boring, lame jobs in my life. I know so many artists who never want to have a job because they think it's beneath them. I always, like I wrote four, but Eat, Pray, Love was the book that finally made me not have day jobs. Mm -hmm. And that was Eat, Pray, Freaking Love. <laughs> like I had written three books up until that point and still didn't quit my mm -hmm. day jobs because I loved my creativity so much that I didn't want to make it pay for my life. You didn't want to burden it with I that did not want to burden it pressure. with that responsibility. So I had a job. I always had jobs. I had a bunch of jobs. Job, have one. It's great. No big deal. Like it doesn't define you. It is not who you are, mm. right? Just cool. what you do. Just what you do. It's fine. It's what you do for a crust, mm. as we crust. Australians say. Nice. Um, <laughs> career. Here's another thing you don't have to have. Mm. Don't have to have a hobby. Don't have to have a career. Don't have to have a career. A career is something you should have if you're passionate about a thing. If you want to devote a punch of energy into mm. it, if you want to pour yourself into advancing and growing and learning and shaping and changing things and being, a career is like a super accelerated job. Like you can not like your job and that's fine, but if you don't like your career, you're in the wrong career mm. and you should just get a job. Mm. Mm. right just forget about it and just go get a job like don't pour your life into something unless you want to mm. and that's mm. what a career is lastly a vocation. vocation this is a sacred thing this is your calling this is the thing that makes you want to get up in the morning this is the thing when I asked you today what are you most excited about right yeah. now in your life usually your vocation is something like that yeah. your vocation does not necessarily have to have anything to do with hobby job or career your vocation is your own people you can lose your job Someone can take your career away from you. No one can take your vocation away from you. Mm. That is your sacred gift. What are some examples of vocations? Your, it depends on who you are, but for some people, raising their child is their vocation. You know, it's the thing they know they were put here to do. Or travel. Or... Travel can be your vocation. Kindness can be your vocation. Mm. S like, exercise can be your vocation. For me, writing is my vocation. It also happens to now be my career. And your job. 
it's not, I guess it's sort of my job, yeah. For a while when I was a journalist, I felt like it was more my job. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not a journalist anymore. Writing books is more of a vocation for me. But yeah, it happens to be my career, but writing was my vocation for a good 20 years before it was my job. And so just because your creativity, whatever it is that you do, whether it's baking cupcakes, right. painting, writing, if it's your hobby, your vocation, your job or your career, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like one's not superior to the other. No, and you also don't have to have a vocation. Yeah, right. The only thing you have to have is a job. Okay. <laughs> really. Awesome. That's it. The rest of and it. And that you don't even have to enjoy. No. This is great news. Do you see how great this is? Just, that's fine. You can find, because if you have a hobby that you love, yeah. then your job doesn't really matter. If you have a vocation that you care about, your volunteer work, your, your, mm. your commitment mm. to saving the environment can be your vocation and mm. your job can be working at Starbucks. You know, it's fine. Um, so, so I think what happens is that we try to make that all one thing. Mm. So everybody's mm. looking for one thing that they can do that's all of those things, that supports them financially, that answers their soul's calling, yes. that is a pleasure to work with. See, because my vocation is not the same as my hobby because my writing is not always pleasurable. Sometimes it's really arduous, sometimes it's really painful, sometimes it's really boring. Mm -hmm. Karaoke is always pleasurable. <laughs> My hobby is, I wouldn't do a hobby if it wasn't always pleasurable. Gardening for me is always fun. You know, so, so to conflate any of those things with each other is to misunderstand. Such an interesting way. There's so many aha uh -huh moments happening in the so. audience, I think. We're, we're, and, and you can find that on your Facebook page where you talk about it in more depth. Yeah. I think there's another book there. Um, we're going to have questions shortly, but I wanted to ask you about another post that you wrote, um, which is about how you said you've <laughs> noticed this thing where women, when other women have had plastic surgery and women say, I just feel so sad. <laughs> that makes me so sad that such and such looks like she's in a wind tunnel or has these crazy boobs or she used is to on the red carpet and her so face doesn't Oh, my move. God, it's so sad. Makes me so sad. And I'm I, so sad. But I am sad. Okay, so I, I read Not that and I went... Not a little judgy. So judgy. Not a I, little superior. Well, I read that and I thought... Oh, shit, I say that all the time. Yeah. And what, what do you think's bad about that? I think it's bullshit. I think... <laughs> I think it's a way to gossip and pretend you're not gossiping. Um, and I think it's a way to gossip while making yourself look virtuous. And I think it's a way to take down another woman's choices about what she's decided to do with her body and her face and her life without acknowledging how tricky it is for all of us to make those choices. Um, and that there is this giant spectrum now where you can land as a woman on what you're willing to augment and change about yourself. And you can be in any number of positions along the way. And when you land in your position, you have to be very careful not to be contemptuous and judgmental of women who have gone farther this way than you mm -hmm. or not as far this way as you, right? Um, so y y it's hard to do. But it's, it's a kind of, kind of self-hatred, and it's a kind of hatred against other women, and I just think it's mean. And I also think it's distracting. I also think there's some deep hypocrisy, especially for left-wing feminist women like myself, where I'm willing to stand in a picket line mm. to defend to the death the right of another woman to do whatever she needs to do with her uterus, but I can judge what she does with her lips and her boobs, right? Like... What part, this mm. is your right, but this, somehow you've crossed the line, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, right? Um, you know, how about I say your entire body is your business? Your entire thing that you're doing with how you are walking out into the world as a woman is your business. And I think you look fucking great. Whatever it is you decided to do, I think you're great. I think you're great. And if you needed, and I'll tell you this, if a woman has made herself look like she's walking through a wind tunnel, she needed to. And she needed to because that's how she was going to feel safe walking through the world. But now, it's tricky, right? There's yeah. like patriarchy and there's the media. No, no, but like and I'm you know, sad that yeah. she feels safer walking through, that she feels that she has to be a wind tunnel right. to walk through the world and to feel good about herself. I feel sad for myself that, my God, is that what I'm going to have to do as I get older to be considered still attractive and just palatable as a woman, not even attractive? Well, apparently not because you don't consider her attractive. But when I say I'm sad, I guess I'm sad that 
the base level for women yeah. is the Kardashians. As Amy what Schumer, is the, what is the great, who, who used the, what God gave them as a, just a general a light role? Light suggestion. Light suggestion. Yeah. Um, I mean, exactly. Do you know so what? do you know what I mean? I'm scared yeah, that that is considered the baseline of what's attractive for humans. Yeah, but then before women. that, it was Marilyn Monroe, and before that, it was, it was, it was, um, I'm trying to think of who was the great, uh, it was, it was, oh my God, let them eat cake. It was Marie Antoinette. There's right, always yeah. been a, a superficial beauty queen who is the baseline. Um, you know, and there always will be a superficial beauty queen who's the baseline. I'm not worried about her, and I'm not I'm not worried about her. And I feel like the question becomes a distraction from the really important questions about women's life. I don't care what you do with your tits. But what if everyone's doing it? They aren't. <laughs> they aren't. They aren't. We aren't. They aren't. And there won't be some weird dystopian future where literally everyone has new tits. That is not going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, they aren't all doing it. A lot of more people are doing it. But, it's, but, but what I want to know is, are you safe in your house? Are you safe in your house? Are you safe in the relationship mm -hmm. that you're in? Um, I don't care about your boobs. Do you have control over your own money? Um, like, the number two cause of death for women in America is domestic violence. Mm. Um, the most dangerous person in a woman's life, statistically speaking, is her husband or boyfriend. Mm. I'm worried about that. I don't give a shit what you do with your face. Mm. I don't care about this. You know, I don't care. It's the same thing when people like really spend hours and hours. And I know that academically, and I'm a f huge feminist, I know that academically words matter, things matter, visions mm. matter, all this stuff matters, but there's stuff that matters more. Mm. You know, um, the most physically augmented human being you will ever meet in your entire life as a woman is Dolly Parton, who is also one of the most powerful women in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, like what she has done creatively, what she's done with her life, the way she's controlled her career, mm -hmm. the way she manages her public image, mm -hmm. the way she has been expressive and creative and powerful and rich and generous and cool and compassionate. Like, you put her next to... I can't believe I'm about to say this. Some bullshit yoga hippie mama who's yeah. actually really contemptuous and mean. Yeah. I'll take Dolly. Yeah. You know, like I just want you to be decent and and fine. So so I yeah. feel like so when I hear the sadness thing, I feel like I yeah. don't know that I totally because I I often hear it and I think if you take away the part of you who's being judgmental and contemptuous, mm. then maybe I'll believe that you're actually feeling really sad about Renee Zellweger's face. But I don't hear <laughs> All I hear is contempt. All I hear is contempt. I'm, I'm just making the lines between my forehead, like here, where I would have Botox. Discussion about women's bodies. I'd be really pained to hear about the neighbourhood where people are stealing our minds. Yeah, but this is important too. I mean, we'll you know we'll set a little side of time time yeah. aside for this. We um, uh, we. Uh, but maybe yeah, point maybe taken. we've reached our okay. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you also about, um, with creativity, the role of fear that yeah. that plays and vulnerability and how I know Bre Brene, Breen? Brene Brown, Brene Brown yeah. writes a lot about that. Yeah. Um, how do you manage those two things day to day when you're talking about creativity? Well, you have to understand that fear and creativity are natural companions in this sort of psychic topography of, of your life because I, I, in the book I say that fear and creativity are conjoined twins. They're always going to be with each other. Um, and, and the reason they're always going to be with each other is because they have completely different motives for how to protect you and how to enhance your life. They're working at cross purposes, right? So your creativity is constantly gonna ask you to enter into realms with uncertain outcome and to enter into landscapes that you've never been in before and to try new things and to take risks. That's the job of creativity. Mm -hmm. That's its job description. If your mind is an office, it sits in the, the, the corner of the office where that is what it's trying to do, right? Your fear doesn't want you to do any of that. Um, because your fear has been programmed by evolution to be very suspicious of circumstances with uncertain outcome. Mm -hmm. Because when your fear doesn't know what's going to happen, your fear assumes you're all going to die. We're all going to die. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, therefore we're all going to die. And that's a really good evolutionary reflex because it keeps you from, <laughs> keeps you from dying a lot of the time. Um, you know, like, I don't know how deep that water is. I'm not going in. And I don't know what's around that dark corner. I'm not going around there. I don't know. You know, this is what your fear's job is. And I think that when we battle our fear, like so much of the language 
that we talk about, about fear, is, is very aggressive about battling and about, you know, I'm gonna show fear who's boss, and I'm gonna dominate my fear, I'm gonna get rid of my fear. I feel like that doesn't work. It doesn't work for me mm. um, because anything I've ever fought fights back harder, first of all. Like you throw a punch at something, it usually throws a punch back. So anytime I've ever tried to show fear who's boss, fear has been very quick to remind <laughs> me who the boss actually is. You know, it just doubles down and comes down harder on me. Um, you know, and I feel like instead, there's something missing from our conversation with fear. And one of the things that's missing is just a sense of respect and reverence and gratitude to it. Every mm. single one of us in this room can probably point to a moment in your life where your life was saved because of your fear, where you are literally here and alive because your fear saved your life. That's huge. You literally owe your life to your fear. Mm. If not directly in your life, which I imagine probably you can think of a moment, then in the lives of your ancestors who managed to live long enough to procreate because their fear kept them alive, right? Mm. So we owe our fear a lot. So the first thing that I do when fear arises is to thank it. Mm. Um, so rather than just hating on it or getting resentful or trying to punch it out, the first thing I say is, I am so, thank you so much. I know that you have, that your job is to protect me and that you're just trying to protect me. Thank you for all the times you've protected me. I am grateful for your service. I'm just trying to write a poem right now. I'm pretty sure nobody's gonna die, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so if you could just stand down, that'd be <laughs> awesome. You know, and it does, if you talk, like, like all relationships, if you explain yourself, it usually works out, right? It usually works out. And, and then I try to explain what I'm doing. You're, you're, conjoined twin sister creativity and I are about to go on a road trip together and you can come with us because I know you will this is how I talk to fear mm. I know you will you always do um, but you're not allowed to sit in the front seat you're not allowed to touch the radio you're not allowed to hold the map <laughs> you're not allowed to choose the snacks and you are absolutely never allowed to drive but you can sit in the back and you can scream every time we get to a corner about how we're all going to die because that's apparently your job and you do it beautifully it's like inside out yeah, it's totally, yeah. when I said that out, I was like, that's, that movie, that's and when exactly I talk, what you described. And when I talk about this sort of spirit of friendly, you know, like just friendliness that mm. I have toward myself now, that includes the friendliness that I feel toward fear. Mm. You know, just, it's, I've made friends with it. It's my, it's my oldest companion. We've been together forever. Mm. Um, and it's always going to be with me. I have no interest in becoming a fearless person. That's a sociopath. Yeah, right. Right? I've met some fearless people in my life. They're fucking insane. And when you look in their <laughs> eyes, that reptilian weird, there's yeah, something yeah. missing. Something's, and they're dangerous to themselves and other people, and you just cross the street when you see them, you know. <laughs> so I don't want to be fearless. Mm. I want to be brave. And a brave person is somebody who feels fear and then does the thing anyway, mm. you know. Mm. Um, that's what I want to be. And to be brave means that I have to be really patient and generous with the parts of myself who are fearful. I don't know how else it works. And the vulnerability of putting yourself out there again and again and again, yeah. is that is part of overcoming that getting a lot out of the process itself rather than being too attached to the outcome of it? Yeah, and part of that is ego versus soul. So, you know, here's the thing. You have an ego. I have an ego. We all have an ego. Some of us might have two. <laughs> um, you know, I have a very substantial... Don't worry. I have a very substantial ego. We, most of us do, for good or for bad. Um, and the definition of your ego is how you know that you're standing in your ego. Is It's the part of you that can never be satisfied. Mm. You know, there's just never enough cake. There's just never enough sushi. There's never enough love. There's never enough praise. There's never, there's just never going to be enough. So mm. you, you know, the ego is a treadmill. It's like this acquisition and ascension treadmill where you do a thing and it goes well and then you have, it's, it doesn't satisfy. Um, and that's all right because that's part of the makeup of what it is to be a person. And we all have that within us at some level and it's fine and I'm not at war with that. Mm. Um, a soul is a different thing. And the soul asks a whole different series of questions. You know, the soul's questions are all about like, you know, really the Mary Oliver, what are we gonna do with your one wild and wonderful life, right? Mm -hmm. What did we come here to do? What makes us wanna get up in the morning? Um, who do we love being with? Who brings us to life? Who, who sparks joy? Um, you know, who, who makes us feel like we live in a world of infinite possibility? How, how can we align our lives to be so our energy fields are crossing with those kind of people mm. more. What's the stuff that you, that you do that makes you forget time is passing? That's a really mm. good indication of the fact that you're doing soul work is that you look up and two hours has gone by mm. and you didn't even notice. That's, and all the soul wants is, is wonder and connection and love and joy. And I have that too. You know? so, so the ego part of me when I write a book and somebody says something terrible about it is injured. You know? um, but the soul part of me is like, unaffected. 
The soul part of me is like, can we do it again? <laughs> Come on, let's do it again. That was so awesome. <laughs> and sometimes you feel like you took this leap. I had a conversation with Brene Brown about this on my podcast where when inspiration calls and you leap and it doesn't work, right? And, and like there's this, I don't know if you have this here, but there's this bumper sticker all over the, the very delusional United States that says, jump and the net will catch you. Mm. Leap and the net will catch you. Look, we're all grown ups here. Sometimes it doesn't catch you. Mm. Sometimes you jump and you land in a heap of broken bones and it didn't work. Mm. And at that moment, your ego is so broken and so wounded and your soul's like, that was so much fun. <laughs> when do we get to jump off a cliff again? Did you see how long we floated? Did mm. you see that bird? Wasn't that cool? We were up there and now we're down here. We did it. That's soul work, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to take the ego bruising if I get to keep doing the soul work. And mm -hmm. people who try to create lives where they're never going to get that bruise never get to do anything. fly off a cliff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of a cool thing to get to do while you're here. We are going to take questions in about uh, just a few minutes. So um, think of your questions if you have them. Um, what about, I wanted to ask you about the practicalities of your day and living a creative life. Mm -hmm. Because you travel the world, you speak, you're on book tours. Um, how do you have a routine? How do you manage your writing? How do you do all that? I write by season, not by day. Um, ah. So uh, I used to write every day before I was a published author, because you have to, because otherwise you'll never be a writer, right? But now that I have projects, I write by project. And my projects usually involve a huge amount of preparation. So right now, for instance, I'm working on a novel about New York City in the 1940s mm -hmm. and promiscuous showgirls. Um, I want to write about women using sexuality as currency um, and not being Moss. punished for it. Um, How did that for come it. up? Because I'm sick of, just sick of, book. you know, it's like the story of promiscuous women is always the story of, you know, ending up with your throat cut in, a, mm. in an alley. And I don't think that that is the true history of women and sexuality. Um, mm. I think that there are a lot, a lot, a lot of women who went through seasons in their life of great sort of reckless pleasure seeking and then maybe were done with that and went on and had perfectly and normal lives. Um, I, and, uh, and in the 40s, I think there were a lot of women like that. I've met some of them now, these women in their 90s telling What's me. What's the research process like for this book? Reading tons of novels written in the 1940s. I, and the most important thing for me is to try to read work written in the years that I'm writing about so that I can find the language. So not so much stuff written about that time, okay. but stuff written in that time. Letters, diaries, novels, films, um, just trying to sort of write. So it's a lot of research. So I'm not actually writing the book right now. I'm just researching the book. So and that I can do anywhere. So you have to dive deep. Yeah. Because so you have three to and convincingly. Half years of loss. Yeah. This one probably won't be quite as long because it's. I'm not writing. I don't think it's going to be quite as long a book. And it's more about sort of period of life rather. That book was a 150 year span. And this yeah. is just sort of a, a moment in this woman's life. Um, so do you do something every day? Do I, you? Yeah. I try to. I mean, I didn't for that time when I was tired when I got back from Two butcher. months, yeah. But, but you know what? It doesn't take a lot. This is the thing. I feel like I've seen people quit jobs. You know, I, yeah, I have a job. Quitting jobs to, because they want to write a book. Mm. And I always say, you don't need 40 hours a week to write a book. I don't know any writer who writes 40 hours a week. You're lucky if you're going to write two hours a week. Yeah, like, you don't right. need... You're going to have too much time on your hands. And it's going to feel really like a huge amount of pressure. I'd rather that you set your alarm for an hour early, earlier than work and got up in the morning, if you're a morning person, and worked on your book for 40 minutes a day for four years. Mm -hmm. Then quit for two months and try to do it all at once. Because for me, I feel like the more steadily you can do this... So, so I just have a rule that I have to work on the book an hour a day. Every day. And you can find that hour... You can find that and out. it might just be reading for you. For, for me, it's now. reading. Right now, it's just reading and taking notes. Now, when it comes time to actually write, I will clear off the calendar and sit down, and then I will, you know, get up and. But even in my best days, I'm ne I can't think of a day of my life where I was able to write for more than four hours. Really, you know, it's it's not easy to sustain that. You mm. know, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe you guys do. I don't know creative people who literally create all day long. It takes, you know. I think there's hours. the idea that maybe that's what you have to do to be nah. a proper writer John or John Netflix said uh, the best books you've ever read were written in an hour a day. Wow. Um, I really do think so. And I think sometimes that feels boring and it's not very glamorous because it feels like you should be in the fugue state and you should mm. be, you know, but that's, but, you know, the, I love Goethe's line, never hurry 
never stop. Mm. Never hurry. Never. It's like, or maybe it's never hasten, never stop. But it, the idea is, don't you don't need to chase this thing like a maniac, but don't ever stop either. And, and our day is very manageable. Um, half an hour a day will do it. You know, you can find a half an hour a day. I have people who get on Facebook and say to me, I would love to be creative, but I have absolutely no leisure time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, you are literally <laughs> on a social media site telling me. And then sometimes just for fun, I go look at their Facebook feed. <laughs> and I go look at the shit they do. And like the shit that they, like the t five minute cat video that they, I'd like you had five minutes last week. I know where your time is going because you're <laughs> advertising it. Like, you know, and, and I had, you know, one of the most important questions that, that I ever got as a creative person was when I was in my 20s and I had a bunch of jobs and I didn't ever had enough time to write and I still had that dream. I write about this in Big Magic when a letter that Melville wrote to Hawthorne mm -hmm. saying, I dream, I'm dreaming of this book that I want to write and I'm dreaming of the slow green grass growing summer hours in which a man ought to compose inspiration, right? Because every artist dreams that there's going to be this day that comes when you have the beautiful sunlit studio and, and somebody gave you a grant and you've got a spouse <laughs> who's supportive of your work and you've got maybe an advantage. You know, like we all, it ain't happening. Not at yet. Melville never got it and he wrote Moby Dick anyway. You know, like I never got it and I wrote Eat, Pray, Love anyway. Like we don't get, you don't get this kind of time. I wrote my first two books in the reading room of the New York Public Library because it was the only quiet place in my life because I had so many roommates and I didn't have anywhere to go. And so I wrote it in a, in a library. I would go there every day and work. I never got a room of my own until mm. my mm. third book in, but I did the work anyway. When you love it, you do the work anyway. So I was complaining to this older artist who I really admired, this amazing woman, <coughs> about the fact that I didn't have enough time to, for my work, the, complaint, the constant complaint that creative people have. And she said, the most important question anybody's ever asked me creatively, she said, what are you willing to give up mm -hmm. to have the life that you keep claiming you want? And, mm -hmm. and I said, I mean, it, it hit me like this, and I said, wow, I guess I have to really learn how to start saying no to things that I don't want to do. And she got this really compassionate big grin, and she said, oh, Liz, no, it's so much worse than that. <laughs> You have to start learning how to say no to things you do want to do Ooh. with the recognition that you have limited human energies and you cannot do all of the things. Hard enough to say no to stuff you don't want to do. And so I was just sort of processing it and she said, um, that, you know, she said, you don't have enough time. She said, what's your favorite TV show? This was in the 90s. And I said, The Sopranos. She said, not anymore. <gasps> You're never watching another no. episode of that. <laughs> And I never did. I still don't know how it ended, although I guess none of us, <laughs> from what I've read, nobody knows how it ended. Um, but she said, you're done, you're done. She said, you're telling me you have time for Tony Soprano's life, but not yours, mm. the one that you keep saying that you want to have. You don't have time for your life. She's like, what's your favorite restaurant that you go to with your friends? She's like, you have time for that? You know, what's your favorite magazine? I said, The New Yorker. She said, you have time to read all those great writers in The New Yorker, and you have no time for your own work, right? You're canceling that subscription. Stop telling. She said that, that. She's strict. Really strict. But she's like, basically, she said, Are you serious about this? Mm. Or are you just pretending that you're serious about this? Because if you're serious about this, then you'll start making sacrifices so that you can have the life that you keep pretending that you want. That's essentially what she was calling me out on. You keep pretending that you want to be a writer, and then you keep going out to bars till 1 a.m. with your friends. So which is it going to be, right? Which is it going to be? What are you willing to give up? And, and it was so life-affirming. And I've had that conversation mm. with myself again and again and again. I have to rehab that conversation with myself. And you have to keep giving up new things, like yeah. more things. And looking at where, where's your energy going, right? Because a lot of the complaint that we have is, I don't have any energy, I don't have any energy. I'm mm. so tired all the time, I don't have any energy. And I had to get really real with myself about this recently and be like, I have tons of energy. I just waste it on stupid shit. I waste it on, I waste it on things, I waste it on trying to make people like me who don't like me. I waste it on trying to save friendships that are toxic. I waste it mm. on staying up reading stuff on Instagram. I waste, I, like, I waste it on hating myself. There's a good waste mm. of energy. That's a wonderful place for a bunch of energy to go. I waste it on judging myself. I waste it on criticism. I waste it on contempt for other people. Mm. My energy's going in all sorts of places. For me as an inherently energetic person to say, I just wish I had more energy 
This is the metaphor I always use. It's like Mike Tyson saying, I wish somebody had given me some more money so I wouldn't go bankrupt. Guy spent $500 million on things like albino Serbian tigers and golden bathtubs. There's an equivalent in there about what we're doing with our energy. Mm -hmm. What if you have plenty of energy, but you're just squandering it, pouring it away into stuff you don't care about, stuff you can't fix, stuff that's never gonna get better, stuff that doesn't matter. What matters? What really matters? And how much are you willing to actually do something about it rather than pretending that you care about it? With your level of fame and, and the, the connection that so many of us feel that we have with you, how do you create boundaries so that all your energy doesn't go out to everybody? I'll give you an example is that on this last tour, um, I realized I was going to be on tour for Big Magic for four months, a tour that started in September in New York and ended in Dece middle of December in Germany. And that doesn't include mm. what I'm doing here, right? Um, and it was basically a different city almost every day for four months. And, and I wanted to, because I'm passionate about talking about creativity, and I wanted to bring this out, and I like doing this. And I realized the only way, if I was very real with myself, that I could figure to do this without getting sick was to not do the book signing lines mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, and, and are I, they draining? They, are, they aren't if you are doing one book event. They are if you're doing four months of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And they're draining. They're not draining if you don't care about people. Mm. But they're draining if you like to meet people where they're meeting you. Mm. So if somebody comes to me in a book signing line and they're in tears because they want to tell me how much my book meant to them, I want to meet them where they are emotionally, which mm. means that I have to show up at, at a certain level of energy for them, right? Mm. And, if, and if the next person, uh, you know, is really shy and mm. I need to draw them out, that takes energy. And if the next person is weirdly passive aggressive and about to say something really savage to me, I have to meet that with a certain kind of energy. You yeah. know, it's like each person has mm. to be met wh wh where the, who they are and that takes. And, and I really struggle with this because I feel like I don't want to be ungrateful. People travel a long way to see me. Mm. I know what it means to have an author sign a book that I mm. love. I don't want to be that per I don't want to be a diva in my ass. And I finally just said, the only way I can do this is by not not mm. doing this anymore. Mm. And by telling the audience every night, like I'm doing with you, mm. why I'm not doing it, right? Explaining why mm. I'm not doing it and letting them hear my explanation and letting me be okay with their disappointment. Right? Like, I think one of the major ways that you can start to create healthy boundaries in your life so that all your energy isn't going into what Brene Brown calls the biggest energy suck of all, which is saying yes when you want to say no. Ooh, yeah. How many of you are so tired mm. because you've been spending your life saying yes when what you really want to say is no? Right? So, if you can learn that it's okay that other people get disappointed, mm. you know, um, there's this bullshit story going around that says if you start saying no to people and setting boundaries with them, they will like you more. I am here to disabuse you of that. They won't. They liked you better when you did everything they wanted you to do. <laughs> they liked you better when you took on the extra work. They liked you better when you were like, I'll pick up the kids from daycare. They liked you better when you were like, no, it's fine, I'm fine, I can do it. They liked you better when you sat in the book signing line for three hours and took selfies with everybody and signed every single book. They liked me better, right? But mm. I don't have infinite energy and I don't have infinite time and there's work that I want to do before I die and I don't know when that day comes and because of that I have to be okay with other people being disappointed when I say I'm terribly sorry but the answer is no because I'm making something that really matters to me and that has to be all right and that's the true believe in. Uh, please raise your hand and we will get someone to you with a microphone. I think there's someone just down here. Um, hi. Hi. I'm sorry. I've had my back to you all night. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm going to try and make this short, actually. What does... Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does a start look like for you? Is it an idea? Is it you sitting at the desk and waiting for inspiration to arrive, what does that look like for you? The desk doesn't usually come till a couple years after the idea because I need so much preparation to, to, to get to the desk um, b before I actually start writing. But the, the start is usually just um, a tap, tiny, 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 like this, a curiosity. Um, and I've spoken about this before, about how much I advocate curiosity over passion. 
we live in a society that has a really big, big fetish about passion, and everybody's waiting for passion. Everybody wants lightning in the bottle. Everyone wants the voice from God. Everyone wants to be able to say, and that was the moment my whole life changed, and I knew. Um, this is not how most people's lives evolve. So really, when, the creative journey to me is a trail of breadcrumbs, not a, not a lightning bolt, right? So it's about paying very close attention to the inf like almost, almost invisible tiny little clues that come to me where a part of me goes, that's kind of interesting. That's like a one eighth of a percent interesting. And having the, the trust and curiosity to look for the next breadcrumb that's associated with that. Well, that's cool. What would it be? And then now you're, you're on the journey. So it's, it doesn't start with a thunderclap. It starts um, with something, a voice that you almost cannot hear. Um, the tiniest, tiniest hint, usually it barely even has a pulse, but I have such trust and curiosity. And I have such trust that if my curiosity is telling me something that is interesting, there's a reason. And I also trust that if I'm interested in something, other people might also be interested in it, because I'm a pretty representative human being. Um, so that's, that's how, what the start looks like for me. You would barely notice it. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to let you be the bad cop who calls so on people. I'll be here. Sorry, I've got the mic. And um, hopefully I can articulate this question, because it's kind of bumbling in my mind a bit. You made some interesting points about you've got all this, you've got limited amount of time and we often use this time to hop on Facebook and you're like, I have no time so, you know, what am I going to do with that? But sometimes it's just, you're so tired and it's easier to hop on Facebook, it's easier to like sit in front of the TV, it's easier to zone out. Mm -hmm. For you, what do you do to actually go, you know what, it's easier for me to you know, hop on Reddit and just scroll through and just mm -hmm. zone out, as opposed to using that time in some way that you want, in, in the way you want to live your life. So what is it that gives you that little ding to say, you know what, I'm wasting mm -hmm. my time here? Um, it's easier, but it's more boring. You know, like if I could find something to do that was more interesting than writing, I would do it. And I've never found it. And even when writing is hard, and even when it's unrewarding for me, and even when it's difficult, even when I can't solve a narrative problem, it's still the most interesting thing in the world for me. So there's a limit to how many hours I can watch Big Bang Theory before I'm like, this, isn't, this is easy, <laughs> but it's, I'm not feeling alive. Um, I'm not feeling, I'm not getting anything out of this. This isn't doing anything for me. Um, and, and again, it's also about sort of self-accountability. I also know that if I, it's weird, exercises like this for me as well, um, the negotiation begins almost as soon as I wake up about the first thought I have every day is I'm not exercising today. Um, <laughs> before I even open my eyes. And then the negotiation begins. And sometimes the only way to stop the negotiation is to do the thing, yeah. right? Sometimes I get so tired of the negotiation of my mind about, should I work on my book or should I watch TV? Should I work on my book or should I watch? So I get so bored of that conversation. Mm. There's really only one way to, to have that conversation go away and that's to work on the book. <laughs> and sometimes the only way to stop the negotiation about should I exercise is just, just exercise and then that's settled. You know, otherwise it, it's gonna never stop. I've got one more question. Um, oh, down here, you've had your hand up for a while. You can just shout it out. I can shout it out. <laughs> I really appreciated your views on fear and inviting it into the car. That really helped a lot. And the other, I feel like a cousin with fear is overwhelm. That seems to always mm. come up that when you know where you want to go. Mm. And, Put the um, mic up to your mouth. You have to yep. be patient to arrive there. I, mm -hmm. don't, I am finding it hard to deal with having a clear vision, but still being patient enough to know how do you deal in the day to day when your, your goal is over here. And yeah. you, you, there's so much to be done between here and there. Mm. And it's overwhelming because you think I should be focusing on all those big things. Yeah. But there's 800 details between here and there. And in yeah. your case, it might be four years of research. Yeah. And for other projects, it might be 800 different facets that come into the production of the ideas yeah. made. Yeah, if, it's, if the project is an alphabet, you're at B and you want to be at X. Or when you can see the whole alphabet, right. you can't produce the alphabet in one day. You have to, it yeah. might take years to get to the whole alphabet. I feel like you just answered it. <laughs> you well, know, I, know what I mean, I know the but you know, idea yeah. That people give. I yeah. feel like you might have some bigger insight versus um, breaking down. Do I have any sense. better better help than that for you? Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I've always I love this line. E.L. Doctorow, the American novelist, had a line that said, "You can drive across an entire." Speaking of driving, mm -hmm. you can drive across an entire continent. Say it's dark and you're driving across the outback. Y you can drive at full speed with headlights that only show 20 meters. 
You know what I mean? Like you, it's, and, and so you're actually making tremendous progress, but you don't need to, you don't need to, it's, you only need to see this much ahead of you right now, right? Um, and if you're trying to, if you're trying to see the whole continent as you're, as you're spanning it, of course you're going to become overwhelmed, you know? Um, and, and so for that, I guess there's just, I mean, I wish there was a more glamorous answer than a list, right? Mm. <laughs> I mean, a list and a kitchen timer, right? Okay, here's the list of things I have to do. Here's a kitchen timer. I'm going to set it for one hour. What can I do on this list in the next hour? Mm. Um, so you match the timer to the list, and then that's, that's living in the real, right? It's the living in the present moment that's hard when you're trying to, you're already thinking about the future. Yeah, mm. and you, you know, and you also have to, you know, my friend, again, I keep talking about Ann Patchett, but she's so great. She has this wonderful metaphor about how her favorite part of the project, of her creative project, is before she begins writing, before she even begins researching a book, the dream of the book. Because mm. the dream of the thing is so beautiful. And the, her favorite part is when she's alone with the dream, and it's unsullied. And, and she calls it the tourmaline butterfly. It's this jeweled butterfly that's floating, and only she can see it. And it floats around her head, and it's so, and it catches the light, and it follows her everywhere. And while she's washing dishes, she's dreaming about this beautiful thing that she's going to make. And it's so precious, and this is the one that's going to win her the Pulitzer, you know. And this is the, like this is the novel that's going to make her really ascend to the level of Dostoevsky. This is the one, you know. Like, and it can be the great thing about the dream, is it can be anything you want because there's no limits on on your fantasy about what you want this thing to be that you're making. And a lot of people spend their life there, you know. And if that's satisfying and great, terrific. But if you want to make a thing, what you have to do then and the way Anne describes it is so perfect, is you have to pluck that fluttering, beautiful, immaculate, perfect, unsullied tourmaline butterfly out of the sky and place it on the workbench and take a mallet and <laughs> smash it <laughs> into a thousand pieces because that thing can never be made. That thing can never be made. It doesn't exist. Mm. It, can never, it can only exist in the ether. It can never exist in the real. So if you want to keep it in the ether, keep it in the ether and never make anything. But if you want to make a thing, you have to murder that thing and just let it be. You have to shatter it. And then the thing that you're going to make... When you're finally done, like this is the thing I love about the creative process. And the reason that it doesn't make me so tormented is because I actually love that this is true. That when I'm done with my attempt at a tourmaline but butterfly, what I have created is the most jacked up, fucked up, weird thing. It's like I took some silly putty and some glue and I took like some cigarette butts and like an old circus poster <laughs> and a hinge from an abandoned shack behind the middle school and I like sewed it all together. I was like, look, I made a butterfly, you know, and like it's got one wing that's kind of like this. It is so far removed from this. But here's the thing. This thing is real mm -hmm. and true. And this thing is a fantasy. And I like the real and the true thing more mm. than I like the fantasy. And I want to spend my life doing that. And the cool thing about being, if you can be friendly to yourself as a creator, is when you're done making my jacked up cigarette butt silly putty half-ass limping butterfly, <laughs> what I always feel when I'm done with it is I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. No one ever made one like that before. <laughs> And you know what? Probably for a good reason. <laughs> and no one will ever make one like that again because the immaculate perfected thing is strangely mass produced, right? Perfection is, is very boring mm. because it's like some ideals. Very, but the weird, crooked thing is the thing that only you could have made and only you can make it in the time and the restrictions that, that you have in your real life. Um, you know, with the materials that are on hand, with the time that you've got, with the talents that you have, which are also limited, you know? Um, and, and the way that when you make that crazy jacked up butterfly, what you're saying with it to the world is, I made a thing, look, I'm here, I'm here. And here's the evidence, I'm here, I made a thing. And the arrogance of belonging, that lovely line that the poet David White talked about um, that I mentioned in Big Magic where he says, in order to create, you must stand in the arrogance of belonging. It's a kind of entitlement that's very different from Kardashian and Kanye entitlement. It's not a kind of entitlement that says, stands on a chair and says, I'm the greatest. That will never work. It's never worked for me to do that, to, to kind of pump myself up to do work by saying, I'm the greatest. Because guess what? I'm probably not. <laughs> like all evidence points to some other pretty great greatests. You know, 
But guess what else I'm not? I'm not the worst. I'm not the worst. There's an enormous amount of real estate between the worst and the greatest, and I'm somewhere in there. And by standing in my bare feet and bare face, somewhere in between the worst and the greatest, and taking the materials that I've got, the time that I've got, the talents that I've got, and the energy I've got, and making a thing, and then being like, hey, guys, look at the new thing. You know, and when I write, sometimes when I make a thing, and I get really criticized for it, like when I used to read my reviews, they would tell me everything that was wrong with the thing. And mm. I'd be like, do you think I don't know that? <laughs> <laughs> do you think I don't know that this is, you think I think this is a tourmaline butterfly? I think this is just a cool thing that I made. And guess what I'm going to do now? I'm going to go make another one. Mm. Unlike anyone that anyone else ever did. And that's an amazing way to spend your life. And so when I focus on that, instead of crossing the continent in one bound, you know, or creating the perfected dream object, or winning, then you can do not anything. Like the whole you can do anything thing is also a line. You can't, but you can do something. And doing something, I think, is better than the dream of doing anything. Mm. You're welcome. <laughs> what a fantastic note to end on. Liz, thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's just been an extraordinary night to hear everything that you've had to say. And here's to making more fucked up butterflies for yes. all of us. Thank you all so thank much. You. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Mia. Elizabeth Gilbert. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, guys. Good night. <laughs>